Hi, everybody. Let's walk. Welcome back. We're doing another lesson on ecology. Today, we're going to be talking about how to look at population changes. So we call an, our earlier uh, earlier lessons we were talking about, right, those food relationships, how our organisms interact as far as food chains, food webs, and food pyramids. Now we're going to look at how can we look at a specific species at the population level of ecology how can we look at a specific species and look at the changes in the population size? So the first thing that we need to be able to do is we need to know some of the basic vocabulary that goes along with this. As we start to look at population changes, there are four main things that will change a, pop, a, a size of a population. We have our birth rate, which is, of course, the number of births within a certain time frame, whether it's the births within a season, births within a year, births within a decade, but our rate of births, right, the number of births within a year. The other thing we look at is then the death rate, right, the number of deaths that occur within that population within a certain amount of time. The other thing that can affect the population besides organisms being born and dying is migration, the movement of organisms from one place to another. And when we talk about migration, there are two types of migration. We have immigration, which is where a population moves into a new area, and emigration, where a population is moving out from an area to a new, to a new location. So if we're talking about, for example, the school pond, we had immigration of a pair of ducks this year that have moved into our pond, right? So our pond duck population has gone up and we have emigration. We have the emigration of geese. Last year, we had a whole flock of geese hanging out at the pond. There are no geese this year. And so the geese have emigrated. So they have our population of geese have gone down. When we're looking at these things that change our population, we have both our birth rate and immigration, which increase. We have both our birth rate and our and immigration, which will increase the population, cause the population to go up. And we have death rate and emigration, which are things that decrease the population, cause the population to go down. As biologists, we can look at these rates of population change and we can actually calculate these rates of change. And it looks like a really complicated equation, right? Oh my goodness, look at all these letters, look at all these meanings. But really, if we break it down, we add together all of the things that increase the population and then we subtract all of the things that decrease the population. And when we do that, we end up with our rate of population change. So once we have our rate of population change, we've looked at our population changes within a certain time frame, we can then graph those population changes over time. As we graph those population changes, they, tend, they will fall, in, for increasing populations, they'll fall under two categories. The first type of population growth is exponential growth. Now, exponential growth happens within a population when there are no current limiting factors, right? So there's nothing, there's no limit on food, on water, on shelter, on space. None of the things that limit how quickly a population can grow, we get exponential growth. An example here, a great example would be when we're talking about bacteria. So if I have a beaker full of bacteria in an environment, as time goes off, right, from zero minutes up to two hours, okay, we're okay, right? Go from one cell to 64, but within another 10 hours because every time that number, that every time that number gets larger, it then doubles in the next, uh, in the next time slot. By the time we get to within 12 hours, there are close to 69 billion bacteria cells in that in that beaker in that medium because there is nothing limiting the bacteria's growth it had plenty of space had plenty of food and whatever resources it needed to be able to grow exponential growth can happen with any species but one great example of exponential growth 
is the human population. Human population was relatively stable until the last, until about 1600, where we had start, where we had exponential growth. We've gone from one billion in population to just about eight billion. How did this exponential growth happen? Well, we removed some limiting factors. Okay? So from 1600 to now, we had increases in technology, which allowed for right for more food, more clean water, technology for uh, for housing, for medicine, right? So limiting factors, things like uh, things like disease or injury, that kind of levels out a population with human technology and medical care. We had right. We had we kind of solved a lot of those problems, and so the human population is something that has grown exponentially in the last 500 years. Now, in the real world, with every exponential growth, eventually the population reaches a point at which the resources start to run out. Those limiting factors start to come into play. And as that population slows down because of those factors, we reach something called the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is the population size that an environment is able to support. Again, if we look at a growth, if we look at the growth of this type of population change, we're looking at something called logistic growth. So we have, an, so we have here an exponential growth at the beginning. As resources become more limited, it levels off. There's more competition for those resources. Our death rate increases, and we level off to a we call the carrying capacity. The population limit for that organism in that ecosystem. In something like a forest, we might be talking about the number of trees in a square mile. We might look at the number of hawks that we might look at the amount of hawks within that forest within that square mile. We could look at the amount of squirrels living inside that square mile of forest. And each organism is going to have a different carrying capacity based on the resources it, it needs and the amount of resources it needs for that space. We can look at a graph of population change over time and determine what type of growth it is, whether it's exponential or logistic. We can also determine the carrying capacity from a logistic growth. So we look for each one of these. Again, each one of these is a different organism in a different environment with different needs, and therefore the carrying capacity for each of these is going to be different. If we look here for the paramecium, which is a single cell organism, we're going to see that they're carrying a capacity for their environment that they're being grown in is about 900 paramecium in every milliliter of liquid. If they are growing, if we look here at Daphnia, we can see that originally the Daphnia population goes way up here and then it decreases, it levels off, and we end up here. So we could say that this right around here, 135, is our in every 50 milliliters, that's our carrying capacity. If we look here at our fur seal, you can see the fur, fur, fur seal population, there's some fluctuation goes up, comes back down and it levels off at our carrying capacity at about 9,500 seals on this particular island in Alaska. So we can look for trends or patterns in population change over time to determine the carrying capacity. When looking at how population changes happen, when looking at birth rates, especially of different species, we notice that there are two types of strategies that organisms use in having offspring, right? So different strategies that they have selected for in how to maintain or increase their populations. Over here, so we have something called K-selected species. K-selected species are species that invest time into their offspring. They produce very few offspring, maybe a, a small litter or a small clutch, and they spend time raising their offspring to close to adulthood before their, before their offspring go off. So humans, elephants, bison are all great examples of K-selected species. Uh, chimpanzees, gorillas 
uh, wolves, foxes. So canines also are a case selective species. They have very few offspring. They care for them until the, or until the offspring reaches adulthood and can fend for itself. And then it goes off uh, into, right, onto, into adulthood to do its own thing. When we're talking about our selected species, these are organisms that are just playing a numbers game, right? They're selected to, if they can produce enough offspring, that these offspring have a chance, a numbers game, a probability of survival. And these are ones that they have produce a lot of offspring, but they don't invest time. They don't stay with their offspring into adulthood, right? So if we think of way back when, if we ever read Charlotte's Web, right? So Charlotte had her, had her big egg sac and all of her babies threw little strings and they flew off, right? So, so insects and spiders are a great example of an R-selected species. Uh, fish, you think about like fish and frogs and other amphibian will lay hundreds and hundreds of eggs before they swim off uh, to go about their lives and their offspring, their, let's say their 500 eggs, the, they're selected that maybe most of those eggs are going to, right, most of those eggs are going to die, most of those eggs might get eaten, they might dry out, but enough will survive to carry on the species. Plants are another type of R selected species. Obviously, a plant isn't going to raise its offspring. So, this time of year, a really great example are the cottonwood trees outside. If you're looking in the air and you see the little bits of white cotton flowing through the air, each one of those is carrying a seed. So, plants, of course, use R selected species. They produce hundreds of seeds, right? Hundreds of offspring, and they don't care for them. So, the idea is that enough of those seeds will land in an area where they can grow that the species of plants will be able to carry on. All right, guys, so these are some different things that affect our population changes, how we can calculate population changes, what are the, what do the graphs look like, and how can, we, what can we call some of these different increases of population changes that we see. I hope you guys have been able to review a little bit of information and have learned something new. All right, thank you.